Hello everyone on the YouTube, on the Meet and uh, in the room. I um, really like to see you here in person uh, because uh, the, there's a huge demand for this talk, uh, mostly from the English speaking uh, audience. I, I will speak um, in English from my heart. Um, so let's start. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, IntelliJ Debugger Essentials and the Essentials because we, uh, I tried to uh, tell uh, everything about the debugger, but the rehearsal took more than three hours, so it seems like we need to split that into several parts, and today we, uh, I will present the first part, which is the very, very, very super basic like the things that uh, most people who use the debugger knows already, uh, but uh, maybe it would be nice to have the basis uh, f to speak on one language. So first of all, why do we debug? And what is the debugger? Uh, the debugger is a special tool. Uh, debugger exists actually not only for Java, of course, for many other languages. And it allows to run the application in the strictly controlled uh, environment, uh, usually allowing to execute the program line by line and to see the inner state of the application and to change it and to do some many, many, many other uh, interesting things. So first of all, why we debug at all? And the word debug and debugger uh, has the has a bug inside. So uh, usually this tool is used for finding and uh, fixing bugs. Uh, this is what it was created for. And most people uh, tend to believe that this is the only uh, use case for this tool, but it's not. And uh, I want to show you some more usages. We are not gonna talk about all of them today, just about several, and on the ne next lecture about the advanced debugging, uh, I will cover all of this. So the second thing is code analysis, which is the debugger uh, could be used for. And by code analysis, I mean not the analysis inside the ID itself, but the analysis by the user. So when you see the code and you want to understand what it does, uh, you can basically interpret and execute the code in your mind, in your head, or you can use the debugger. So using the runtime information, having all the values uh, and, the, uh, and seeing the branches which the execution follows, uh, making uh, understanding of the code much easier. So just looking at the code uh, with your eyes uh, is much harder. So people are coming. Please uh, see it, okay. So as I said, what parts of the code are executed uh, and the values of the variables and memory uh, gives you much more information about your code. Also, if you uh, having problems uh, figuring out what's happening inside the fully unknown uh, huge uh, code base, uh, usually it's much easier to start with uh, debugging it because you will be able to easily see which part of the code is executed, which are not, and how are they executed. So once again, the dynamic part, um, dynamic information from the runtime gives you much more understanding of the code. Also, debugger allows you to change the behavior of your application, because you can not only see the inner state of the program, but you can also change it however you want. And usually by changing the inner state, um, people think about changing the source code, which will change the, in the inner state of the application. With the debugger, it's not the case. You can modify the data uh, anyhow you want. So without changing the source code on the fly. So if you need to reproduce, for example, the complicated setup, uh, you can either do that with your hands, so sometimes it's really complicated and takes a lot of time, or you can debug, uh, dive inside your application, change the state of the variables of the memory, 
and quickly appear in the state where the bug is reproducible. Sometimes it saves a lot of time. Also, you can switch the application state on the fly. So for example, if your application like IDEA has a special test uh, unit test mode, you can switch it uh, on the fly. You don't need to restart it. And there can be other application states and modes which you can once again switch on the fly and see how the application works in different condition without the need to restart it and reset variables or any other input information. Also, I've heard uh, about at least one company who did the patching of the real production um, application. Uh, because the debugger has the hot swap ability, which allows you to change the source code or change the code of the methods on the fly, uh, so you can uh, easily change the application behavior on the fly, fix bugs on the fly, and do that even in the production. I don't say it's a good way, but anyway, I've heard at, le at least once about this experience. And also, I did that uh, more than once with my idea, which I used on my machine. If I find a, a bug uh, which is blocking me from my everyday activities, I can quickly attach the debugger, fix the bug, hot swap my working idea and continue working until the, for example, next nightly build is available with the fix. Uh, so this is kind of strange usage, but anyway possible. Uh, what else? Uh, with the regular source code, if you need logging in your code, you need to add some logging statements inside the source code. And then you recompile, rerun it, reproduce the problem and see the log and al analyze this. Uh, with the debugger, you can do that on the fly without the need to restart the application, recompile it, and without even the, the need to change the source code. So you can add any logging information at any place in the source code and see the data appearing uh, as, as you run it, further run it. Uh, user interface developers uh, in the IntelliJ, for example, but actually anywhere uh, using IntelliJ debugger could do uh, painting debugging. So uh, IntelliJ debugger could show you the image of uh, any image object in the uh, debug process. So you can actually line by line debug the painting of the components in the user interface. And by line by line, I don't mean the line of lines of code, but lines of the shape which is being painted on the screen. Um, debugger can provide information about the memory. So uh, like any memory analyzer or the uh, memory snapshot uh, viewer, uh, it can show you all the contents of the Java heap. So any, uh, any object of any class uh, could be analyzed and uh, changed and uh, you can do whatever you want with it just like in any uh, memory analyzer. Of course, the functionality uh, it provides is kind of uh, less smart uh, and it's just minimal, but for many, many use cases, it is enough. And uh, actually there's a lot of mo more usages here. I want to say about one of them, which I call a breakpoint bump. And uh, this is funny technique. So when you are struggling to reproduce a, a bug on your machine, and uh, what I do, I set a bug, uh, a bug, a breakpoint uh, with a special condition uh, so that this breakpoint is triggered only when the bug appears. And then I forget about that. So I use the debugged idea for some time. And usually after a day or two, I can reproduce. Uh, suddenly, <laughs> I hit this breakpoint and bumps, the bug is reproduced. So I don't do anything. I put a breakpoint bump, and someday it will blow. And I will find uh, myself in the situation where the bug is reproduced. Uh, so uh, what's the point in that? Uh, if we can set more logging in that place, uh, and the reason why this is better uh, is that with the logging, you only get the stack trace and the information you uh, set it to log, to be logged. 
if you stop on a breakpoint, you can observe any data, any state uh, of the application uh, so that the analysis of how you got into this situation is much easier when you have the running application in the debugger. Uh, okay, as I said, there's actually much more usages of the debugger. I will not talk about all of this today, but you got it. Thank you. <laughs> well, actually, it's not all. Now we switch to the demo. So the rest of the presentation will be in the idea. Uh, I hope you are familiar with the basic um, a presentation of the code and the idea. This is a presentation mode, so there's no funny tool, tool windows and so on. Uh, but hopefully you can see the, the code. So this is a sample application I, I just did for, for this presentation. It reads the input, it, it prints it back, it does some simple filtering of the input, and it does some simple processing uh, after that. And it's all done in the endless loop so that we can uh, see what's happening in the debugger inside. So how do you run uh, the application in the debug mode? Um, the talk is about essentials, so you just start it with the debug action, of course. So you can do run or you can debug. Uh, for debug, you do debug. It's easy. So now we have the application running in the debug mode. And why I'm talking about this? Uh, many people are used to the idea that the, once again, debugger is a tool for finding bugs. And if I don't find, uh, don't, uh, if I'm not looking for bugs, I don't need debugger. As I said before, it may be not true because uh, if you run your application, you may appear in a situation where you need to analyze the inner structures. And if you run it and not have started it with the debug action for Java, it is not possible to debug it after that. So you may be able to do the thread dumps, but you will not be able to observe the inner structure, to uh, run it line by line, and so on. So I prefer to always start the idea using the debug action, just in case. Because uh, historically, debuggers uh, slow down the execution of the application, but it's not the case today. Uh, the overhead exists, but for many, many, many use, use cases, it's really, really small. So I usually use my own idea in, with the debug options. And it may be slow in some cases, but for most cases, it's not visible at all. And also, if at any time I experience a bug, and I can ask my colleague to debug me. Dimitri, please debug me, I always say to my colleague. So he can attach to my machine, debug my idea, and quickly find the root cause of the problem. So if I didn't start the idea in the debug mode, this will not be possible. I will have to restart the application, and possibly or probably uh, the bug will not be uh, reproduced after that. If you start it with the debug, once again, you can easily and quickly debug it and uh, find the root cause of the problem. So now we have the application running in the debug mode. What do we do? Well, actually, we can do anything you want. So we can see that the application is working. It accepts the input. It does some output. And uh, what do we do next? So. Um, once again, if this code wasn't this simple, it may be hard to understand where to start the analysis from. So uh, in the debugger, there is a special action called the pause program or the suspend, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, which will stop your application right there when it works right now. So here you can switch to the debugger tab and see the, all the threads which are working inside the application. And now we are in the main thread. I hope you can see that. Yeah. And the call stack. What is the call stack? The call stack is the sequence of the method calls which uh, led to the, the place where we are right now. And we are right now, as you can see this highlighting of the line, inside the native read bytes method. So uh, you can see from the bottom of the stack that we started with the main method 
and it called the read method. You can see it on the line. And the read method called fill method, and the fill called, called read again, but it's another read. And the read called read bytes. And the read bytes is a native method blocked inside the JDK waiting for the input here. So now we can actually see where all of this started from. So we can find the user code which led to the uh, current state in the application. So we can set a breakpoint. What is a breakpoint? A breakpoint is a point in the source code uh, where the application will be stopped uh, in the debugger if it reach, uh, reach this uh, point in, in the execution. So we can resume. Now this action resumes the flow of the application inside the debugger. And we can type something here. And now you can see that we stopped on a breakpoint. So we set it here using a click on a gutter, gutter or you can use the uh, shortcut to, to set and then uh, unset it. It's easy. Uh, what else you can do with this? You can once again resume it. And you can see that, that we stopped here once again. And that is because actually, even though we entered just one letter, um, the input contains two symbols. One is the letter and another one is the line break or the some other symbol, probably line break. So even the information that we stopped here twice, twice uh, gives you something already. So we stopped here twice. I don't believe that many people understand, <laughs> could have understood that from the code itself. So we entered only one letter, but stopped here twice. Uh, this is only possible in debuggers, so you can understand it from the code that the input would contain two symbols. Okay, so we can move this breakpoint using drag and drop, for example, or we can delete it there and set it again and put it inside this if. So once again, we type something here, and now we can see that we stopped only once. There we stop twice, here we stop only once. So even from the fact that we stop there twice and here once, we can understand that filter does a job. So it filters out something, which is really nice because we haven't yet even saw the, uh, the code of the filter. And now we see that it does not accept the line break symbol, which is obviously that second symbol in, in the sequence. So what can we do next? Uh, we can set several breakpoints at once. So for example, you want to stop on every line in this uh, method. Uh, you can easily do that using the multiple carrots feature. And you set multiple carrots and then um, call the set breakpoint, breakpoint action. And it will set a breakpoint for every um, line on, on uh, which you have the carrot for. And this icon here means that there's no um, executable information for this line inside the bytecode, so the breakpoint will probably not work. Well, not probably, but for sure will not work. And this check mark here means that there is information for this line, and this breakpoint will work. So, uh, for example, for this line, we cannot even set a breakpoint because there's no source on this. Uh, line And for these lines, uh, there is some source, but for some reason, because of JDK, compile it this way. Uh, for this line, we have information. For this, no. So um, this is not a kind of um, really nice way to debug your application using multiple breakpoints. I mean, on every line. And I will talk about this later. Uh, what, for example, uh, if you don't need some of your breakpoints temporarily, you can disable them. So I'm using the alt click or the middle mouse button click on, on other operating systems to disable the breakpoints and uh, they will simply stop working. So these works and these don't. I can disable all of them if I don't need them at the moment. But if you really need to disable all of them, there is a special action for that, which is called mute breakpoints. And what it does, it simply disables all the breakpoints. Now you can see they are all uh, became gray and it doesn't work at all. So you can do whatever setup you need to prepare for the debugging. Uh, and then you can enable them all at once again. And once again, they work. 
So uh, what's next? As I said before, it's not really nice to debug your application setting a breakpoint on every line. So uh, for sure, you need a way to execute your application one, uh, one line by, by one. And for that, we have special actions. Uh, most useful of them are step over, uh, which will basically step over the line, uh, not going inside the method calls if there are any on the line. And step into uh, does the opposite. It goes inside the method calls if there's any on the line. So you can see on this line, we will go inside the filter method. method. Yes, isn't that nice? Okay, and from here, how to step out of here? This is really trivial method, but there's an action step out, which will um, mostly do the uh, continue execution until the return from the method and then stop. So we can do this, and now we actually stopped after the filter method. Okay, so let's uh, do some more interesting stuff. For example, here, we have the math max call, and if we do the step into, we may um, actually think that we will appear in the max method, but it's not true because the max method is from the uh, JDK. And by default, we filter out such methods because usually people are not interested in the JDK or library methods. So we do not uh, step into those methods by default. And there's a special filter set in the settings you can Modify that if you want. But if you really need to step into such methods, you can use the force. Uh, use the force, yes. The force step into method, and it is red, uh, red arrow here, and it will step into any method, skipping all those filters. So you can see that now we stopped inside the uh, JDK max method. And it's really simple. So we step out. And now let's step into this print line. Print line, it's more more fun. So here on the second line, you can see that we have two method calls, uh, which is right line and value of. And if you do the step into here, it will highlight both methods, giving you the choice. Um, so you can choose which of them uh, you want to step into, and. Uh, you can do that with the mouse or with the keyboard, or you can just uh, do the step into shortcut again, and it will select what is chosen right now. So we, we do this stepping inside the right line, and we appear here. Um, what if you want to skip some lines? So like here, what if I want to stop on, on this line? Uh, without doing step over again and again. There's a special action for that called run to cursor. And what it does is basically written here, it continues until you reach this line. So you can think about it as setting a temporary breakpoint on that line and resume. And also you can do that using the click on the line numbers and it has the tooltip. Or on the Mac, you can do the force touch on the touchpad. Ah, that's great. I, I never use the force touch, but this, this one is really useful if, if, if you can get used to this. Okay, so let's continue this and stop and suspend again. So here in the stack, as I have shown before, there are many frames from the JDK and one frame from the user program. And you can see that uh, some frames have this yellow background. So for me, when I started using IntelliJ Debugger, it took like several months to understand why the background is yellow for some frames. And for some frames, actually in the idea project, um, the background could be blue and also green. So um, if you don't know, uh, the background for any class of file can be yellow, um, green, or blue in, in the idea project. So even in the um, project view, as you can see, the library classes are uh, have yellow background. And uh, 
actually test classes have a green background. And IntelliJ IDEA project uh, blue background is used for the open API classes. This is actually set up in the file colors. And it is not about the debugger, but debugger uses this as well for the highlighting in the stack frames. So in the IDEA project, there is more settings here for the open API and actually for the C line, they use the violet or purple, I don't remember. Just in case you see these strange colors there, now you know what it is. Um, now you wanna know more about the inner structure of the application, I mean, inner state of the application. So how do you see that? You stop somewhere. The easiest way to see the values of the variables is the inline debugger. So you can see here, uh, after the end of the line of the source code, appeared uh, the information about the values. So read has the value of 100. It's, I think it's obvious here. Some people may ask why we show it twice. Um, actually, we show it once for the nearest usage of the variable. So uh, here, for example, read and the nearest usage is here. And this one is for the declaration. So we show it here because it is declared here. And args is declared on this line and never used, so we show the value only once. And this one is an empty array. Uh, this is the easiest way, and sometimes uh, you may need more. So for example, here, uh, you can see that the S value is an exclamation mark and text out is a, and then a, the type and the unique number of this object. And this object does not provide the to string uh, information, so we only show this here. And the information is updated, so uh, if you get the values you need from there, then you don't need anything else. But what if you need more? So there is the variables tab where you can see all the values of all the variables available from this context. So for this method, uh, you have this set of uh, variables visible and you can switch frames and obviously the visible values changes and you can ex uh, ex expand this and uh, see the inner structure of the objects, uh, all the fields, uh, no matter private fields, public fields, debugger can show you values of anything, anywhere. And from here, you can quickly jump to the uh, declaration of this variable, or you can quickly jump to the type source uh, for the objects. And um, what if you want to see something which is not uh, in the uh, inline debugger information or the variables view. So for example, here on this line, let's stop there. Uh, we have a complicated expression <laughs> containing a, a method call and, and some other logical operations. So obviously uh, you can see the value of this simple variable and you can see that in the inline debugger information, but you cannot see it for this expression because it involves method calls and we don't uh, invoke methods because debugger is afraid to somehow modify this state of the program. So we expect the user to ask the debugger to do that for them. And for that, we have the quick evaluate functionality. The easiest way to use that is to hold the alt uh, modifier uh, to move your uh, to have the mouse over the parts of the expression you want to evaluate, it will automatically expand the um, selection to, to the expression, uh, correct expression. So for example, you can start with arc and the value is obviously 100 and then evaluate max, also 100 and then this expression is zero. And of course it's true. So this is the easiest way to get the a value of an expression which is available in the source code. And if you don't use the mouse, you can do the same from the keyboard using the quick evaluate shortcut, which is, as far as I remember, command alt F8. And you don't need to do the selection, just uh, set the caret somewhere where it's obvious 
what expression you want to, to observe, and it will get the expression and the value itself. If you want, you can, of course, do the selection uh, the old way, and, and once again, hit the quick evaluate and see the result. And if it is an object, uh, you will see the result in a slightly, uh, oops, sorry, in a slightly different way. It will show you the whole tree with all the fields and, and the rest. So you can um, inspect the object from here and then just close it and forget about that. Um, what if you want to see the value of an expression which is not in the source code? So for example, here uh, in the print um, right line method, I want to check if the uh, string contains, uh, for example, a symbol. So I, I do that with the evaluate expression dialog. Here you can write any expression in Java or in Kotlin or in any other language which you are currently writing in. And uh, you write it as uh, if you uh, been in the code itself. So you are in the same context and the variables are available and you can call any methods and do whatever you want. And also uh, what's good inside the debugger, as I said before, you can uh, invoke any methods, including private methods. Uh, debugger don't care about such things. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe I want to check if the line uh, starts with one and which is obviously false. And once again, you can alt uh, hover and uh, if you forget the value of s and check the value. Okay, and then you can do whatever you want with the, oops, sorry, with the um, expression, uh, with the result of the expression you get from here. So, for example, you can do the concatenation of the strings. And then you can, I don't know, um, check something from, from other parts of the system. Um, for example, get property oops, with the name Austin. Yep. So basically you can do whatever you want, just like if you were in the program itself. Um, here, here you can switch to the uh, code fragment, fragment mode, which is um, basically multi-line version of uh, what we had before. And you can write a small program here with any kinds of uh, things you would like. So for example, I can, um, oops. I can dump some numbers and you can see the uh, output in the console. And you can once again use the information from the uh, current context. Uh, so once again, uh, basically you can write a small program here. And uh, actually many people do this. Uh, so when they find the bug or the problem in the application and they have the fix, uh, they quickly check that the fix works uh, inside the evaluate expression or the code fragment um, dialog. And then they don't uh, need to apply the fix and check it again because they have done it al already in, in the debugger. Uh, if for some reason uh, you need even more, so for example, you need to see the, um, the result of an expression in any context, uh, debugger has the watch functionality. Uh, so you go to the variables tab and you uh, hit the new watch action. And from here you can write once again any expression. And the difference with that uh, evaluate expression dialog is that this expression will be evaluated in on every stop in every frame. Uh, so you will have it uh, here on top of the variables all the time. So if you need this, you, you may use this once again. So for example, um, uh, that thing the, with the OS, OS name, for example, you want to know it everywhere. So it will be reevaluated on every stop in every um, location. So for example, if you use uh, local variables here, you will probably 
end up uh, having this expression uh, being unable to evaluate in other contexts. But sometimes it is useful. And you delete it, and you can reorder them if you have more than one. And also, you can add them from the uh, editor using the add to watches. So it, once again, as in a quick evaluate, it will uh, uh, automatically find the expression and add it to the watches. And uh, what's more interesting here, you can do that from here. So for example, you, you have the deeply nested field or, or something else, and you want to see it on top. So you just drag and drop it from here and it will automatically generate the expression and have it here. Uh, and once again, you can drag and drop from the editor itself to, to, to this variables view, and it will create a watch for you. Uh, what's more? Uh, what if, uh, for example, here in the read, so as we know, filter will filter out the uh, 10 because uh, 10 value because it's it's the line break value. What if we don't want it to be filtered out? So we we check it here. Filter returns false. So obviously we will not go into process. So we can go here. We can issue the set value and change the value to I don't know 10,000 more. So now. We change the value, and the filter doesn't filter this out. So we proceed to the process. And um, well, basically here we can change it back. So just in case we wanted to check how it works inside the process, and then we can actually change not only the primitive values, but the values uh, of any object. So here S is the exclamation mark. We can go here and change it to the question mark, for example, and we resume the program. And in the console, we can see that it really uh, printed the new modified data. And once again, you can do that with any field, uh, almost any field for final fields. It's, it's not possible, but with almost any field and almost any uh, for local variables, that's true as well. Uh, this is really useful, uh, as I have shown before. Uh, if you have some branches which uh, you want to see how they work and you don't have the data right now to be able to step into uh, the method, so you change the data and you can uh, go into any branch you um, probably uh, wasn't able to go before. Um, and now, the top feature of today's presentation. Uh, some really um, experienced developers who were not really familiar with the debugger before, um, like once in a year, uh, one of them come and ask about a feature in a debugger, and the top voted feature from those people are was um, the ability to stop on a breakpoint, not always, but only if certain condition is met. And uh, hopefully, and luckily for them, um, this feature was uh, implemented like almost 20 years ago. And it is called um, and the breakpoint condition. So if, if you right click on a breakpoint, uh, you can see the settings of the breakpoint. Uh, and I will not uh, talk about any uh, other than condition today. So the condition is basically an expression which is evaluated on every hit of the breakpoint. And if the value of this condition is false, we are not stopping the application there. So for example, here, uh, we don't want to stop if the read is 10. So we set a breakpoint condition, condition and we don't stop uh, when the value is 10. So that's, I will show it to you. So now the value is not 10, and for 10 we just haven't stopped. And uh, using this technique, you can once again here write any expression you want using any local uh, variables or fields or any other information you need from the current context. And uh, it greatly uh, reduces the number of hits for 
um, certain breakpoints. For example, if a breakpoint is in the very widely used uh, method, you can limit the number of hits uh, using this. Uh, so um, I think uh, basically this is it for today. So any questions? Uh, so the mic, take the mic, or it will not be on the, I don't know how to turn it on. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I understand. So the question was that the uh, conditional breakpoints uh, has uh, have the overhead. So if you have this breakpoint set in in a really hot loop or or whatever method that is used really really often, this may slow down the application. Uh, so much that you will not be able to wait until the the hit of the real hit of the breakpoint. Is it, this is true? And and the 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 question after that was that is it possible to implement it using the hot swap? So um, currently we're discussing essentials. So I will talk about this uh, in the next talk. Uh, it is true that uh, some people uh, uh, kind of use a workaround of this. So they put this. Uh, condition here, and they do the hot swap, uh, like re-define re, uh, the method body, as I said before, and they set a breakpoint on this line. So you can do whatever you want here and set a breakpoint. And if you hot swap this code, uh, it will really work much faster, and the breakpoint will be hit in the same conditions as before. So the question was, is it possible to do that automatically to uh, be able to set such breakpoints without the overhead? Is that true? Yes. And there is, uh, as I remember, there is such bug. It is possible, but right now we just don't do that. I, I If you really want, I can explain you why we don't do that right now, but probably after the, the talk. Um, I have a question about watch. Uh, you said that. Um, when you add a watch, it's uh, it shows uh, on every stop on every breakpoint. Mm -hmm. So, but if I want to show some uh, in watch some local information, for example, I have two breakpoints, and uh, in at one breakpoint it's uh, some combination of local variables. Mm -hmm. So in our place, it's uh, useless. So how to make a watch uh, local? For, for example, I want to show it every time in on this breakpoint, on this place, mm -hmm. but not uh, on the hours, hours. So there are some ways uh, to do that. Um, but once again, it's not about the essentials. So I will probably talk about this on, on the next talk. So uh, in short, um, there is a request to really keep the watches context uh, dependent. Uh, to be available only in certain contexts or certain methods or certain classes. Uh, for your case, um, you may use the uh, class level watches, what is called class level watches. I don't want to deep dive into this today, but in short, uh, you can add a watch inside the uh, class. So you do the new class level watch and it will be available inside the, uh, inside all the objects of this class. So this is not exactly what you're asking for, but in most cases, it really helps. So for example, you want to see, I don't know, the, the get class of this method. And in, in any object of this print stream, stream class, you will have this node on top. So for many cases, this helps. But it not, it's not about essentials. <laughs>
more questions on, on the phone? Okay, then we are done. Thank you. Thank you.